The history of the British Empire saw its famous red-coated soldiers become renowned across the world. Let's face it, they fought everyone, from those damned American colonists, splitters, to the Zulus and to the Russian Cossacks. Few types of historical soldiers have left us such a strong cultural legacy, something so visual like the red coat. But there is one that gives old Tommy Atkins a run for his money. Yup, this guy, the Japanese Samurai. It may surprise you to know that these two iconic warriors actually fought one another at the height of the Victorian age. Stay tuned to learn how they came to do battle bayonet against Katana and who emerged victorious. It's a fascinating story and one that also includes the first American ever to be awarded the Victoria Cross. Before we get stuck in though, I want to quickly say a special thanks to historian and friend of the show, Josh Proven, for researching and co-writing this episode. You can find a link to his YouTube channel below and also to his book about this conflict. Japan had always been an enigma to the Western powers. It was a place of mystery that had closed itself off from the rest of the world for hundreds of years. Open up. By the middle of the 19th century, pressure was being placed on Japan to open up her ports to trade. Between 1853 and 1854, the strength of the European warships and the example that had been made of China in the Opium Wars was enough to finally get treaty concessions out of the Japanese government. And in 1858, Britain's Lord Elgin was finally able to negotiate the first Anglo-Japanese commercial treaty. This finally helped to pave the way for foreign merchants to do business with Japan. Britain's first consul general to Japan was a man named Sir Rutherford Olcock. He was beguiled by the time capsule that was the late Edo period. And it is a complicated period, so let me try and briefly explain. Closed off to foreign influence since the early 1600s, Japan had been governed by a dynasty of men who held the title of Shogun, which was like a general issimo of the emperor. The shoguns had come from the house of Tokugawa and ruled from a city called Edo, which is modern day Tokyo, since the 17th century. Over the intervening three centuries, the great peace, as it was known, had seen a distinct Japanese culture flourish, including, of course, those distinctive samurai warriors. These heavily armed men were imposing warriors who, amongst other things, formed the bodyguards of the Japanese nobility. At first, the samurai were curiosities to the Europeans and Americans, but after only five years of foreign intervention, things began to change. Japan soon began to suffer from its own political turmoil. The foreigners were now seen as part of the problem, and there was growing animosity towards them. Throughout 1860, a succession of samurai attacks were recorded against the legation staff of several nations, culminating with the assault on the British legation at the Temple of Tozenji in July of 1861. The attack was unsuccessful due to the bravery of the guards, including locally recruited Japanese warriors, who were themselves samurais. Despite that though, several members of staff were wounded. Just over a year later, there was another assassination attempt aimed at the acting consul, Lieutenant Colonel St. John Neal. Two centuries of the Royal Marine Light Infantry were killed by a renegade samurai called Itai Gunpei. He was mortally wounded by a pistol shot fired by a Marine corporal named Crimp. He then committed suicide. This was the first recorded time that British soldiers had faced a Japanese opponent in combat. Lessons were learned from it, and from then on, British staff always carried pistols wherever they went. In September of the same year, a number of travelers were set upon on the road near Yokohama. One of them, named Charles Lennox Richardson, foolishly approached the sedan chair or noriman of a local bigwig. They were known as daimyos. Because of the rules in Japan at the time, they almost forced the hand of the guards to respond violently. Richardson was killed and his two male companions were badly wounded. The sole female present, Mrs. Borrodale, frightened half to death, managed to escape on her runaway horse. War was only narrowly averted when the shogun's government agreed to pay an indemnity and blame was shifted onto the daimyo himself who came from a region known as Satsuma. To be fair, Britain did not want a war with Japan. They didn't want to repeat at the Opium Wars, which had been expensive. Only the merchants were itching for a war with the Japanese. War is very good for business. It was estimated that a war in Japan would require at least 12,000 infantry and over 100,000 pounds a month in expenditure. 
That's big money in those days. By the end of 1864 though, just for security reasons, a sizable British force was now deployed in Japan. It consisted of companies from the 20th and 9th Regiments of Foot, the Royal Marine Light Infantry, the Royal Artillery and the Baluchi Regiment of the Indian Army. By the way guys, I just want to interrupt for two minutes to ask you to share this video with anybody you think might be interested and also to subscribe to my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com newsletter. When you do so, you'll receive a free ebook about the Battle of Isandlwana and receive a monthly email from me with interesting links and stories about military history. All right, guys, let's get back to the story. Ah! But it was now that things began to come to a head. Those earlier attacks I spoke about, the British demanded that the daimyo be punished. However, the ongoing political turmoil meant that the Japanese government was not really in a position to punish him. This led to the bombardment of the Satsuma capital of Kagoshima in 1863. Admiral Augustus Leopold Cooper, an experienced officer who had served in both Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion, brought a squadron of Britain's China fleet into the bay and attempted to put the fort under blockade. The Satsuma shore batteries manned by samurai gunners opened fire. A fun fact is that that day one of the samurai gunners was future Admiral Togo, who went on to be commander-in-chief of the Japanese Navy during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. The Japanese gunners managed to badly damage the British flagship HMS Euryalis, I think that's how you say it, and kill her two most senior officers as they stood talking to Cooper. But the British broadsides did eventually silence those shore batteries and set most of the town on fire. But no landing party was sent ashore. The Japanese guns weren't spiked and Admiral Cooper sailed away, leaving things quite inconclusive. One interesting side note is that an account from the time says that the band of the Euryalis during the bombardment was playing Oh Dear What Can The Matter Be? So things were far from over between the British and Japanese. Those redcoats and those samurais were still going to have a chance to clash bayonet versus katana. In September of 1864 an international flotilla was gathered at Yokohama and sailed to the Straits of Shimonoseki which had been closed to foreign shipping by the daimyo of Chosu. 14 ships of war from Britain, France, Holland and the United States were to set sail to Chosu Domain and demand he open the straits or destroy his forts and cannons. Negotiations failed and both sides prepared for a fight. Admiral Cooper was once more back in charge and as the ships approached they bombarded the Japanese shore batteries. Then, the Naval Brigade and the Royal Marine Battalion, with the French and Dutch seamen and marines, 1,300 men in all, were landed ashore with the goal of destroying all the Japanese fortifications. British interpreter Ernest Sato remembered the mission and watching the Blue Jackets race each other to seize the batteries, he said, as if they were out on a picnic every man for himself. While the rest marched along the line of batteries, dismounted the guns, burnt the carriages and blew up the magazines. Good lads. There was no significant opposition until the British began to reach the beach and they suddenly came under a heavy musket and artillery fire. According to Colonel Souter or possibly Souther of the Royal Marines, parties of the enemy had shown themselves between the trees on either side of the valley and opened fire with field and mountain pieces and musketry, which they withdrew out of sight towards the head of the valley whenever I, my men advanced. I determined to hold the forts on either side of the valley and occupy the men in dismounting the guns and destroying the carriages and exploding the magazines. Souter and Alexander were aided by the Navy, as Satow remembers. The Dutch ship Medusa moved up and threw a few shells in among them, while HMS Perseus, Amsterdam and HMS Argus fired over the hill from their station before Tanaura. This quieted the zeal of our warrior foes for a while. The Japanese defenders were now pushed back to a stockade at the end of a wooded valley. Captain Alexander and Colonel Souter met to discuss strategy. Where are these men who are annoying us? I have enough men to take any battery, asked the Marine. Alexander sketched out what he knew and cried, All right, I'll take the left side of the valley and you the right. The Marines in their red jackets and the Navy in their blue raced one another for the glory of being the first towards the Japanese. Hello. Nowhere. Okay. I'd just like to look good for you. Oh, good. oh thank you. Satow remembered. Sailors running on, now stopping to take aim at an enemy from behind one of the pine trees that lined the edge of the road, and then on again. There was no order or discipline. Some of them wasted their ammunition on imaginary foes on the hillsides. Captain Alexander of the Euryalis fell and broke his ankle. He was carried to the rear by a man named Seaman Seely, who was himself already wounded. 
Meanwhile, the colour party was all but shot to pieces in the course of the fighting. It was a tough old scrap. Both of the petty officers protecting the flag, carried by midshipman Duncan Gordon boys, were hit. Others were even struck with arrows that the Japanese were firing. Despite this heavy fire, the Royal Marines and the naval personnel managed to overrun the Japanese positions. The Japanese defenders fled. Satow wrote that, when distant a few hundred yards, with a loud cheer from all, the leading company rushed on, the succeeding company, while still advancing, returning the enemy's fire, which he continued from the parapet of the moat and the top of an eight-foot wall back in the front side of the palisade. Our men were never checked, and rushing on, swarmed over the wall and won the stockade. For courage under fire, boys, captain of the afterguard, Thomas Price and Henry Seeley, who you remember helped to evacuate the wounded captain of the ship, were awarded the Victoria Cross. Interest, in fact, Henry Seeley was in fact a Yank, one of our cousins from over the pond, and was the first American in history to be awarded the Victoria Cross. Oh, say can you see? Seeley was mentioned by his superior officers as being wounded while scouting the position before the attack, and then maintaining his place in the ranks during it. According to his own account, he even rescued one of his officers, as discussed, and evacuated him to the rear. He said in his own words, I just picked him up like I had many a bag of tatters down in the Sagadayhock County, and pretty soon we was out of harm's way, me and the captain. He was a fine fellow as the captain, and never a thought I gave in getting him away from the rebel bullets. Of course, I didn't hang back none, but as for being at the head of the company after the captain was wounded, there were as others as knew more and me about being boss. <laughs> I love that account, brilliant. I wish I could have done it in an American accent, but as regulars of this show will know, accents is not my strong point. Admiral Cooper was satisfied that they'd done the job right this time, and that there would be no indication of failure like at Kagoshima. The Straits were reopened to foreign shipping. And, much as with Satsuma, the Chosu also now became clients of the Europeans in the aftermath. The British had lost eight men killed and 48 wounded, while the Japanese losses were never really known. Despite Cooper's satisfaction, Parliament back in London was not pleased that British consuls were ordering otherwise unauthorised bombardments of foreign cities, and would soon order Sir Rutherford to return to Britain. But now there was a growing rivalry between the Shogun on one hand and the Emperor Loyalists on the other. Who would rule Japan? Due to the increasing rivalry between the Shogun's faction and that of the Emperor in developing power struggle over who would rule Japan, and the obvious superiority in European weaponry, the Japanese focus on expelling foreigners did begin to wane. There were those still angry individuals who took up the fight on their own, desperate to be rid of these damned foreigners. One example was Shimizu Seiji, a ronin or samurai without a master, masterless samurai, who looked to test his convictions and worth by killing stray Europeans. In November of 1864, Seiji and another man attacked and killed two officers of the British 20th Regiment near Kamakura. No one knows for sure exactly what happened, as only the bodies were discovered. But a report in the Times describes devastating wounds. Here's a quote. The neck of the former, Baldwin, half severed and his cheek cut off. The arm and cervical vertebrae of the latter cut through in two or three different places, and his body disfigured all over with gashes. The killing was evidently the work of some of those armed bravos whom the daimyos keep in their service for purposes of violence and assassination. Obviously, he means the samurai. This time, though, the Japanese government did decide to make an example of Seiji. They captured him and he was executed. Any further potential for war with Japan was reduced when the so-called Bosin or Boshin War broke out between supporters of the Shogun and the Emperor. This critical struggle restored imperial rule. This war largely bypassed the foreigners, although there was a skirmish at the town of Kobe in which a company of the 9th Foot and a force of US Marines drove off some regular Japanese troops from Bizen, who had opened fire on the European diplomats. The Japanese were pursued by Redcoats and American Marines, plus some armed civilians, to a stream bed where Satow recorded that, at the first volley from our side, the enemy turned into a field by the side of the road and fired at us from below a bank. On our returning their fire, they all took to flight. We pursued them every now and then, firing at one or other who had failed to get under cover. But finally, they took to the hills and disappeared completely. Surprisingly, no casualties were mentioned, except for a few wounded civilians and a ship's boy. Then, in March 1868, there was a very dramatic incident that finally proved the superiority of British pistols over samurai swords. As a British delegation returned to Edo to meet up with the Emperor, they were attacked. 
Consul Harry Parks and a detachment from the 9th Regiment of Foot turned a corner as two swordsmen attempted to rush down either side of the column, cutting rapidly as they went. One of the attackers was actually stopped by a Japanese official who cut the attacker down and beheaded him. Could work. However, the other samurai managed to wound Parks' horse, injure several of the mounted escort and hurl himself against the bayonets of the redcoats, hoping to break through them. He kept running and swinging his katana, hoping to kill as many redcoats as possible. Ernest Satow, who was witness to almost everything it seems, wrote that Upon them he hurled himself, cutting one man over the head and inflicting a severe wound. But here his career came to an end, for one of the soldiers put out his foot and tripped him up and the others drove their bayonets into him. But even this didn't stop him, they were hardcore. The wounded samurai darted on, crouched like a tiger and swung his sword with incredible speed. But he hadn't counted on the exceptional skills of one of the Brits there, Algernon Mitford. He was a member of the legation staff and he lived to tell the tale. He said, I knew enough of Japanese swordsmanship to be aware that it was no use to try and avoid his blow. So I rushed in underneath his guard and wrenched his bleeding sword out of his grip. I handed him over to the men of the 9th, but he managed to wriggle away from them and bolted down a passage into a courtyard. The injured samurai was then cornered by another officer, shot with a pistol and taken prisoner. The incident was good for Parks because it allowed him to negotiate from a strong position with the new regime. The reforms introduced by Emperor Meiji swept away the traditions of the old warrior class of samurais before any more violence could break out between the samurai and the redcoats. It had been an exciting and exotic time for those British redcoats deployed in Japan. Though the fighting never developed into a full-scale war, we did see the two warrior classes face off against one another and a lot of mutual respect developed. Indeed, the Japanese and British were allies until World War II. I'll be back next week with another amazing story from British military history, so please do comment, like, subscribe, and share this film and podcast with anybody you think might be interested.